Yo guys, I've got a spark which I'm going to use to ignite the fire for another episode of the Skyrim's Imaginated Soul Seeker series here on the channel. I did get things a little bit wrong in the previous episode. I mentioned Skyline. that this would be the 30th episode of the series. It's actually the 29th. Or maybe it is the 30th. Maybe it's even the 38th because apparently counting past 25 for me is too difficult a task. I'm losing track of these episode numbers. I just record them in book. What can I say? This is like the 8th episode of this session I believe that I've recorded. Or maybe it's not. Once again, uh, my counting skill is definitely uh, going down the drains right around now. What we can do to very quickly uh, garner some free Imaginite chests is uh, collect some books around the MEP. So that's definitely a task we will be conducting in the near future. After all, quick and efficient means of collecting Imaginite chests is exactly the thing that we are after. As you can tell, in this sequence alone, we have three Imaginite chests we can collect. Uh, the Egg Rescue game, the Snail Challenge, and then the one hidden uh, on the platform ledge up there. Over first things first, we've got to push these uh, bookshelves into place. Playing as our dark quick shot, which we definitely haven't seen enough uh, screen time dedicated towards already. Definitely not. Not like this guy has basically been uh, left, right, and centre since the start of the nightmare run of this game. But you know what? When you have overpowered imaginators, do you really expect anything less? My character might be overpowered, but what they cannot do on the other hand is platform to save their life. Definitely has nothing to do with my lack of platforming skill, that's for sure. But like, for example, jumping too early. That's definitely not a skill issue. Absolutely not. So let's flip that switch right there. It's been flipped. It's been flipped real good. So hopefully in the next two episodes we can uh, complete chapters four and five, and then obviously get the Gorkamoli uh, Gorka monster out of the way, so that then uh, we'll be all set up for Fizzlad and the Golden Arcade directly afterward. That's what I'm hoping to get through in this session. But I do need to be careful. It's currently nine o'clock right now, and the shop will close soon if I don't uh, get there within the next couple of hours so in other words i only have a couple more episodes i can uh, record because i have no pepsi max currently in store and i love pepsi max, and pepsi max a little bit too much i'd rather have some in store so i'm gonna have to go out and buy it if i want some you know it's kind of impossible to have something if you don't go out and buy it so yes that that needs to be changed my life essentially depends upon it I just love Pepsi Max that much, what can I sell you? Yeah? No, don't you dare hurt my egg! I mean, I do love eggs as well. Like, e eggs are great, but I don't quite love them to the same caliber as I do Pepsi Max right now. And hey now, worst thing is to be addicted to! I'm a 23 year old man who plays Skylanders on the internet and uh, drinks Pepsi Max mainly. If that sounds like a 10 year old to you, that's because at heart I am 10 years old and I am okay with that. Every other grown-ass man wishes that they had the uh, heart and the mental capacity of a 10-year-old. So let's be uh, collecting these Imaginite parts from Snow right here. It's like uh, the line in Inside Out 2 where Joy mentions the fact that as you grow up, perhaps you just feel less joy. And boy, that line really hit home. As I'm growing older and maturing much more, I'm seeing much more of the complexities um, of what is alluded to by Inside Out. It was specifically its sequel, and that's what makes it such a fucking good sequel. Like, it's basically Pixar's best sequel, besides the Toy Story sequels, because Pixar are not going to make a film better than Toy Story 3. Okay, it will never happen. Toy Story 3 mm, is the peak happen. of Pixar. They are never making a better film than that. Anyone would think that Toy Story 3 is my favourite Pixar film. So yes, try as they might, they will never make a film better than Toy Story 3. But you know what? Inside Out 2... It's not a bad film whatsoever. It's a great sequel. And it has so many layers to it. That's what I admire about it most. And it's also a film where I cried. More than once. <laughs> this is a really emotionally impacting film. Because it just... It, it's basically... Like, relatability of a film. I related to so many fundamental like ideas going on in that film. That I was just so heavily immersed in it. More so than I have been in any other animated film for a while. It's uh, hands down the best animated film of 2024 so far. But without further ado, let's exit the Academy. This could be my uh, Inside Out 2 review of this episode. <laughs> but say, it's a very good film. I'd highly recommend you watching it. And it's great that I, uh, it's great that I can mention about it now because uh, 
in one of the previous episodes that I was re-watching recently, I talked about the teaser trailer of Inside Out 2. So to go from the previous episode where I'm talking about the teaser trailer of Inside Out 2 to then expand upon that further and talk about the film in and of itself. You know, it's a nice development, that. Anyway, uh, we're going to hop in the cannon. And there's only one place to go. Right there! Even though it says not there, but we're going to go there anyway because we're rebellious like that. A bit like Riley in Inside Out 2. This really is Inside Out 2, the episode, isn't it? Like, we're reviewing for movie, we're relating things back for movie. And really, there's nothing wrong with that, given how good the movie is. Like, it deserves to be praised upon. I have seen a couple of people, um, like, negatively review the movie, and for the most part, like, yes, they do have, uh, they do raise some good points like the story does tread a lot of familiar ground when compared to the first one there is a lot of rehashing but at the end of the day like that's what a sequel is meant to be a sequel is made to a film that you liked in the first place so when the film does more of what you liked than what is there to complain about you know there are other sequels out there that are way more um like abusive of this concept of rehashing exactly what the previous films have done, like doing the same but doing it like bigger and more ambitious. So it being an Inside Out 2 as a sequel is not inherent for other film in and of itself. Plus if you like see it as an independent bubble, independent of the first movie, then there is literally nothing that's rehashing because in that context there is no first movie for it to be compared to. So yeah, that critique, sure it's a fair critique and it's something that if you don't want to see it in sequels, that's one thing. But most people who have seen the sequel are seeing it because they like the first film and they want to see more of what made the first film so good. So if they get what they wanted out of the sequel, they get what they were going into the movie theatre to see in the first place. You know, it's a really great way to deliver upon audience expectations, I suppose. It's not like Cars 2 where you go into the film expecting one thing and you get the complete opposite. No wonder why people despise Cars 2 so much. And so, a sequel doing something the opposite of what Cars 2 did. How can you complain about that when you're also the same people who complain heavily and critique Cars 2 so heavily? Which is a very overhated film, might I say. Okay, let's get these into place. Man, I am definitely going on a bit of a rambling streak here. But what we're going to do now is we are going to take off our dark quick shot and replace them with a little bit of Blaster Tron. Blaster Tron! Oh, yeah. Yes, the target's been acquired. The target specifically being uh, that there key, and then after we the key, we're going to get out of here, we're, jet we're going to jettison ourselves out as fast as they appear, and to do so, we're going to hit the tornado, because it's going to spawn us right back at the beginning there. But yeah, they were also accusing the film Inside Out 2 of being basic, is what I've heard a lot of other um, like reviewers state. You know, they said that the film is style over substance because, of course, the animation is great. Like, this is Pixar we'll talk about here. There's no debate in how great the animation is. Um, but they think that good animation doesn't compensate for poor storytelling, even though I think Inside Out 2 is some of Pixar's best storytelling in recent years, which is why I disagree with that critique. I do not think the film is style over substance. The film is plenty of substance because the film just has so many intricate layers to it and the storytelling itself, the world building, is fucking spectacular to put it mildly but now let's uh, obviously tackle the uh, night shrine as wildstorm and then we can do it as the final uh, night sensei that being ambush who's done it once before already but we might as well whilst we're here take advantage of it a second time and duplicate our stats make our imaginations even stronger Yes, Wildstorm looking epic right there. We love to see it, we do. We love to see it. So here we go, ambush. Little bit of ambush. Then after ambush, uh, we obviously have an earth section coming up, so I best pay attention for that. And then after the earth section, we have the uh, Bowslinger Shrine. We skipped that cutscene, even though I promise you I will not be skipping the cutscene. So, oh dear, I made an oopsie. I was just a little bit distracted, making sure that I had, uh, I have all of my scars prepared for in this episode, because obviously, um, I want to swap out for all of the different bow slingers in quick succession when the bow slinger shrine arises. That is, I completely miserably failed that imaginary um, grinding challenge. So there's no point 
um, attempting to get the rest of the pieces from here because it has now became impossible with the ones I have missed already. Okay, that still counted, even though it is meant to be uh, that you jump to collect that piece, I did not jump, and the game said, nah, we're giving you this piece regardless. Oh, let's jump over that because we don't want to take the damage, that would be completely unnecessary. Okay, there we go, let's hop down over here. Let's jump over that, of course. And then Earth is going to be stronger here. So wait for those enemies to spawn, and then, only then, we're going to take Ambush off of the portal. So what we're going to do is we're going to swap out the Golden Queen, but no regular old Golden Queen. We're instead going to take advantage of her variant, because that has been what we've been doing recently. We've been taking advantage of the variants as well as the regular senses in order to uh, further the level cap of our imagination. So in this case, we're bringing them all the way up to level 46, thanks to the awesomeness of Dark Golden Queen over here. So since Dark Golden Queen has a variant, we might as well take advantage of said variant. Gives us um, a different base for the, uh, for the episode points. I almost called it a stream then, because usually when I'm playing this game, I'm usually streaming it. Yes, a different face of the episode. This is a very nice, um, fresh take right here on uh, Golden Queen's character that obviously we've grown accustomed to the regular version, so seeing the dark one in its place instead is a nice, uh, refreshing thing to see indeed. Why am I emphasizing my justification for this dark variant here? I'm playing the dark variant because I feel like an end of story. That's all that matters, really. Plus, this is fun. Right now, this is what fun looks like. Just uh, constantly gold find my enemies. Like, they can't hit me because I'm too busy freezing them in gold. It's glorious being able to hit enemies and not get hit back. So, let's open up the Smash Knight chest for Fruits of Our Labor. We've got ourselves a brand new head, the Gladiator head. We're getting ever so closer to completing that set right now. So now let's uh, grab the dynamite. Just toss some fools back here. Man, I'm glad to finally be taking advantage of all the variants, though. This is very neat indeed. So we're going to have that blown up, and then we're going to make our way back slowly right there. This is some slow, because Golden Queen is one of the um, worst offenders in Imaginators for her lack of movement speed. Like, this game can be slow paced at times just because of how slow the movement speed is on most of the senseis and Golden Queen really does take that to the extreme because she is so damn slow. She does not need to be this slow. Why did the developers purposefully make her this slow? Like, come on, if you want a fast-paced game, you've got to give us fast-paced characters. As simple as that. So let's uh, get on this ball here, held up by... Well, it looks like Gilgrunt. That statue always reminds me of Gilgrunt, which I think is supposed to be the point in all honesty. But that being said, we're going to swap out from one of the dark characters to another. It's time for uh, Golden Queen's fellow Dark Variant villain, Dark Wolf Gang. So yeah, let's uh, increase that level count once again, because clearly we haven't done enough of that already. 46, uh, imagine it's level 47 even, they're going to be incredibly busted. So let's uh, activate this shrine as none other than Dark Wolf Gang himself, uh, earn ourselves a gift in the process. Boom. Okay, at least this time I'm not doing the same uh, mistake as I did for Ambush when he tackled the Night Shrine. At least I'm not um, skipping him this time by mistake. You know, that crisis is being averted. Yes, let's compute and shoot. For our second uh, boasting here is going to be Robo. I mean, it's quite... Uh, Obvious, so to say, what battle class Robo here is going to be because uh, the word bow is literally within the name of a character. You couldn't get any more obvious than that. It's particularly on the nose, to say the least. And there we are with that shrine having been dealt with as well. So we have one final bow slinger here, and that's going to be Buckshot. Easily the weakest of the three. And yet we're saving him for last. And this is also the first time we're placing him onto the portal as well, so it's time for level 48 to be uh, achieved as the ma new maximum level while we're imagining, as I was completely unaware that this is the first time placing him onto the portal. But then again, when it comes to all the magic sensors, we haven't exactly placed them frequently throughout the series, given how irregularly the magic element even pops up in this game. 
Like, yes, you have it in chapter three, you have it in chapter six, uh, you have it in little minuscule um, sections in between, and obviously there's Fear Magic Ground, which is dedicated in its entirety to the magic element, but other than that, you just don't really see it in this game. Okay, this guy's got to go. Die, die, die. Thank you. Now, we'll stay in this bookshot here because, uh, as I mentioned previously, he's had so little screen time up to this point that we're going to take, um... We're going to take advantage of him whilst okay, we can okay, here, to say the least, but that and also, then the area is going to be changing shortly anyway, so there's no point wasting time switching out to Earth, only to have to switch back to life anyway. So let's skip over this unnecessary deep to play Creation Clash without further redo! As a rhyme, make me a poet about even knowing it. Wildstorm. Wildstorm, so we can take that with the might of Grave which sounds just as awesome as the deep voice. Oh dear, those are some Star broken, Gast. busted stones right there. And all of what I have to my name that is incredibly busted is freaking um, Wolfgang. Where's more stones like that, video game? So let's use Chopscotch. Just a bit of an overkill to use her to take out um, Wildstone right there. But that's what we're going to do with it all the same. Okay, there's not really much I can do right now. I might have lost this match already. So let's uh, take back Flare Wolf. Boom. Oh, yeah. Well, luckily they can't take Chop Scotch from me, so as long as I play defensively, we should be alright. Yes, we uh, just barely won that, but in the end, it doesn't matter if we win by 5-4, to four or 6-3, to three or whatever, you know, it doesn't matter what we win by, winning is still winning. But now that reference out of the way, let's flip that switch. That's what we're talking about. That switch got switch five. Just not on the Nintendo Switch in and of itself. We're not switching the switches on the Switch. We're just switching the switches. There's no triple switch section, I'm afraid, because the Switch version of this game is way too expensive. Hell, most versions of the game is too expensive. This is PlayStation 4 version. I paid £40 for this version, and that was just... The game disc, no box, no um, portal, no figures, and it's an American disc too. 40 pounds, that's ridiculous. Anyway, let's bring out a little bit of Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Well, we won't be talking about it if he dies here, which is quite likely given the uh, lack of health he has, but hopefully we'll be all right. Hope for the best and all. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. At the end of the day, this guy's already tackled his uh, Sensei Shrine, so him being lost here will not be as big of a loss as people who haven't yet tackled their shrines. You know, in other words, we can still complete the game to 100%, even with the loss of Crash Bandicoot right here. Okay, cool, he's out of here. And soon his little friends will be too. Okay, cool, let's get him out. Oh, dear, yeah, let's try not to die. This is where concentration comes in, I suppose. Never have I ever concentrated this much playing as Crash Bandicoot. And this is the fourth level right here, so you can imagine how useless he gets in the harder stages. Ow. Well, there goes my first life. And when you revive yourself, you revive with only 60 health. It's absolutely ridiculous how quickly this guy's health bar is diminished. Okay, here we go. Let's take these guys out. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Was that a crate with an extra life? Where did my extra life go? Oh, never mind, it was my bazooka, not my extra life. There is obviously a chance where crates can give you uh, extra lives. Anyway, that bazooka was useless because apparently I could not aim with it whatsoever. Oh, but there is a melon right here, so I was in desperate need of that melon to say the least. Okay, watch out for more of these fellas right now. Ow, I meant to jump over that. The game doesn't care about what I meant to do, however, because the game just kind of uh, uh, did whatever it pleased, and that was a mistake. Mistakes were made, big ones. Oh, wow, but that's a lot of damage, though. Okay, cool. Let's not do the belly flop because that would likely result in me uh, getting hit. Then again, pretty much everything I do results in me getting hit. Okay, cool, he's out of here, which is sweet indeed, and he's out of here too, but this combat section is 
far from over. Now, where are those crates with the extra lives that I'm in desperate need of? Oh dear, we can't even get hit by the small fellas because I'm pretty sure that on this, this uh, difficulty level, even the small fellas, with my lack of health I have remaining, is enough to finish me off. Okay, let's get out of there. Okay, we might just survive this, maybe. Yeah, here we go, let's bounce some crates right into him. Okay, those crates are about to explode. I'm not sure if they uh, deal friendly fire against me, if I'm close to them or not. It would be very stupid if they did, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Okay, cool. Finally, he's out of here, and we survived with the bare minimum health. But none of that matters. In the yes. end, we survived all the same. That is what matters. And we even got ourselves the gladiatorial uh, to uh, torso at long last. I almost called it a torso then. Uh, but yes, with that, we are getting ever so closer to the gladiatorial uh, set completion. And luckily, we won't have to remain as Crash Bandicoot much longer because the air element will be popping up uh, soon. So in that case, we'll be able to swap back to Wildstorm. We saw him previously for his uh, shrine. So we'll get to see him again in his uh, full glory there. Okay, let's dash through here as fast as possible, but also try not to get hit by the lightning at the same time, because I'm pretty sure the lightning would kill me, and that would be the utmost lackluster way to have a defeated uh, Skander imaginable. So let's take him off a portal out through there and replace him with a much rarer sensei, and that comes tenfold right there. We're talking about Wildstorm. Quite literally tenfold too. Crash Bandicoot you can get for about fifteen pounds. Wildstorm at the cheapest is one hundred and fifty pounds. So yes, ten times the rarity and expensiveness. At least that is at the bare minimum in ten times. It's potentially even more than that. And that, my friends, is why Wildstorm is awesome. Okay, we don't even need words to uh, summarize that awesomeness right there. And I keep forgetting that you can't take that shortcut. You have to make your way all the way around. Because the game says so. Anyway, we did forget to tackle the um, Egg Rescue Arcade minigame. I even fell down. Uh, so that's two failures in one right there. We'll say that's not the end of the world right, to get into the one of the um, Egg Rescue minigames. Plus, we now get one of the damned coolest grinding animations in the game. How sick is this? Yes, let's grab every single one of those. Don't mind if we do. Okay, let's jump over. And jump it again. And jump it again. And we're gonna do it again. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. It is weird when he jumps though to go back into his uh, regular like animation jump. Like it's not a very smooth transition going from his uh, old fours back to uh, twos with his sword being pulled out of his ass. Like literally, that's what the animation looks like. It looks like he's pulling his sword out of his ass. It's not great. It's not a great transition. But at least the rest of the grind animation has nothing else to complain about. No, don't leave without me. It left without me. I couldn't even finish my sentence before it left without me. That is so rude. Okay, let's continue on. Once again, we're going to tackle the uh, battle gong as Wildstorm because I'm confident that he can get through it unscathed. Or should he die, at least he has tackled his shrine beforehand. <laughs> so we won't be locked out for 100% objective. Yes, give me this sweet, glorious, Imaginite bits. Give them all to me! <laughs> but now that we have played as both uh, versions of Dark, Golden Queen, and Wildfire Light, we are going to stick to those versions for the remainder of the series, now that we've uh, played them for the first time. And we'll do the same whenever we place um, other variants on the portal. That's what also, I'll just pick and choose between the two. I suppose we'll uh, decide when it comes time to place them on the portal. Or in some cases, not. You know, I think in Golden Queen's case, it's definitely better to play the Dark version because her Dark version is fully upgraded and leveled up, unlike her regular version. Okay, these guys have all got to go, man. They've got to go. They take them out because there's no real like hard and fast rules about whether or not to use the variant version of the Skarda. Like really all stays on the rules is to play as a Skarda corresponding to the current like buffed up bit of the area. So for the Sensei zone, we play Sensei's, uh, 
do the same for magnetos, and then the same for elements. So, you know, we have to play as a light star and a light stone, for example, as long as they're still light, uh, light stars are made. In, in that case, if all the light stars have been defeated, we swap out for chaos in those zones. Okay, here we go, let's take them out. And then if chaos is defeated in combat, and therefore class is dead and unable to be utilized again, so in that instance, we play as the Skarner who's currently on the portal of power. Cannot switch out against the, um, the area changes once more. Yes, now is the perfect time to reinstate the rules when I'm in the middle of a battle bomb sequence. But hey, at least when we stay in uh, the rules, I'm so familiar with these that I can kind of just uh, say them out of force of habit so I can concentrate much more on the video game and the commentary just kind of comes to second nature. So that way it does benefit me playing through a battle bomb with that increased concentration. Robotic shoulders, that's what we're talking about. Man, I say that a lot, don't I? I say a lot of things a lot, including uh, me pointing out that I say things on repeat. But hey, I do that as a form of repetition. The effect, the purpose of the very thing I am repeating. Okay, so let's go straight for treasure. Or I can fall off. I suppose that's the alternative. <laughs> um, so let's grab the treasure a second time, I suppose. And there's some bananas there, so I'm definitely going to be taking advantage of them because I'm in desperate need of bananas right now, it would seem. And if you collect all of the banana bunches in this level, then you earn yourself either an achievement or a trophy, depending on whether you're playing the PlayStation version or the Xbox version of the game. Okay, let's take these fillers out some more. Boom, that's what we're talking about. Okay, sweet, take them out because we can very easily chain our attacks together. This guy has so much flow within his moveset. It's very fast paced indeed. Okay, these guys have got to go. Yeah, sweet, knock them off the edge, that's what I'm talking about. Boom, boom, shake the room. That is one devilish combo, man. That's got to hurt. Devilish in perspective of how much of the enemies feel pain when it's inflicted upon them. So let's pop up into a platform section, which means that I'm going to suck at it because I suck at the platform sections of this game. In fact, I just suck at all of the sections of this game, period, it would seem. Okay, never mind, I didn't suck for once, which is a bit of a shocker, I'm not going to lie. But now we're going to pop over here, top of the vortex, where obviously we need to swap out for our magic swashbuckler, because they are of the swashbuckler battle class, which uh, corresponds with the battle class of the current Doomlander. So let's get that magic imaginator onto the portal right now, our very originally named magic swashbuckler. Man, I wonder how many brain cells it took to come up with that on my behalf. The answer is zero, okay? It took zero brain cells. Okay, let's take him out. Let's hope not for a repeat of the uh, Bazooka fight. But this Doom Land was a little easier, so hopefully it will go a little smoother. Hopefully, at least. You know, you never do know these things. Okay, here we go. Okay, watch out for the attack, because the last thing you want to do is take active base. Less we get hit, the better. Less is more. Let's not forget. Why aren't you listening to me? So rude. Okay, take him out some more. Okay, here we go. We're getting him slowly but surely. And now we're on to the next phase, which is fan flipping traffic. Okay, so let's see what we can change our abilities uh, to and fro. So we have a spin, we have a crisscross, which I definitely want to take advantage of. And now, just like that, I don't have enough money left to upgrade anything other than my tertiary ability. Uh, but yes, these magic attacks are cool, but nothing is quite as great as the orb and ability right there. So we're going to keep with the orb. Oh, I thought that was a projectile, not a uh, melee attack. You know what, this is fine. We have plenty of other projectiles uh, to hit these uh, Doomlander with. Keep our distance. Yeah, projectiles like these right here. That's what we're talking about. Oh yeah, that crisscross deals so much damage though. When I get up close and personal with this Doomlander, 
the Doomlander is as good as finished with it in that scenario. The Doomlander's got to hope that I don't get close and personal with it. And so far, his hopes are not paying off. Let's just say that much. That was some real brutal damage right there. Oh, I love this attack. I love it so much. Switching to it and upgrading it is definitely paying off. Okay, sweet. We're knocking off some of the gear. So we're down to the final phase. This is definitely going a lot better than the... Uh, Bazooka do manage to save least. In fact, we might even get to this level with no losses whatsoever. That would be fantastic. That would be the most perfect, uh, most ideal situation right now. There is no better outcome for this level than no losses whatsoever. To go from one loss on previous level to none in this one would be spectacular. Not even that would be fucking spectacular. Okay, here we go, let's hit him some more. Ow, that was some damage right there, but our first piece of damage in the entire fight. We take damage, but hey, we might have been hit, we hit him back, and we hit him back so hard, in fact, that that Doomlander is not going to be hurting anyone else. It's dead, so it can't be doing much of anything, let alone hurting um, anybody else. No, not that. Anything but that. Let's say, we really took a Captain America speech there to the next level, didn't we? You know, we got hurt, we heard him back. So much so that they were defeated by our might for the very second after they hit us. That is a uh, revenge in its finest form, so to speak. Finally, we have the Commando Helmet. We are that much closer to completing the Commando set. So that is definitely a glorious way to end up the episode. But first things first, we've got to um, sit through these completionist stars. Wow, we were so close to getting all of the dares. We were just short on the uh, speedrun. And by just short, I mean five entire minutes short. So I wouldn't exactly call that just. But still, we were short all the same. And now we're going to eventually... Press the best button for video game there, skip going and get that other necessary deep do out of here. Okay, so let's pop all the way over here. Let's discover the life sensei realm. Not that we're going to be tackling it right there, because I don't want to risk sensei losing a life, life sensei to the life realm here on the Nightmare difficulty. Even though losing the life scars at this point, or uh, specifically the senseis, aren't too big a deal because we've already tackled every single one of their shrines. So let's get this into place. See what lies in wait in this cave over here. Hopefully an Imaginite chest. Oh no, a book! And a book is just as good because a book can uh, earn us an Imaginite chest. Oh, we've got to be careful not to die. Let's not die in the NAT of all things. That'd be brutal. Okay, cool. We've earned the book. That's sweet. Now let's continue finishing these guys off, shall we? It turns out that these guys are harder than the uh, Doomlander fight. But let's get out of here. And now that that's been said and done, let us, without further ado, roll that outro. I cannot, in good conscience, end off this video without first thanking all of my incredible channel members whose continued support helped make these videos possible. Without them, these videos would be near impossible to make, so from the bottom of my heart, I truly appreciate every last one of them. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, there are plenty of options on screen now to explore, and please consider subscribing to keep up to date with all my content. On that note, this video is coming to an end, so thank you so much as always for watching. Until the next video arises, peace!